I cannot stress enough how important this stuff that we're about to talk about is for the purpose of the exam. The Real Estate Commission is very fond of rules. It's their job to make up the rules. They have a big ego about rules. They want you to know their rules. They test them very strenuously. In my opinion, it's kind of silly how much emphasis we put on some of this stuff, but I don't make the rules, they do. And so I think a lot of times when people start studying, they, because it's not in a chapter, they just kind of forget this stuff. They don't study it. Here's one thing I will tell you. If you know everything on these nine pages, it is impossible to fail the state-specific portion of the licensing exam. And that's honestly the truth. Those 40 questions, well, four of them are the HUD statement. The other 36 all come from these nine, 12 pages right here. Because that's all that section is built for, is North Carolina's specific rules and laws that they want you to know. And so, while I think it's a little bit, in my personal opinion, a little bit too much of an emphasis, the one nice thing about it is, it, there are going to be a lot of gimme questions. But they're only gimme questions if you study the stuff enough to memorize it, because it's just straight memorization. There's no thought required about the stuff we're about to talk about. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to hit the things that I think are very likely you'll be asked about, things you need to know, things you need to understand about real estate commission rules. Okay? All right. The first thing, and one you'll definitely see test questions about on page 596, the requirement for a license. We've already had this. We just didn't call it requirement for a license. We defined it as a broker on like day two of the class. And we said, and if you remember that slide, it says a broker is anybody who's licensed to buy, sell, list, auction, exchange, yada, 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 real property for others for compensation. Those are the four key words right there, right? You're doing it for somebody other than yourself and you're doing it for pay. I'm gonna go a little bit further than that for a specific kind of pay. Instead of saying for compensation, put for commission. Because, remember there's exceptions to that rule, right? The exceptions, when you have do some of those things, you sell property, for somebody else and you get paid for it, what's that exception where I don't need a license? <clears throat> no, not an auction. I need a license for an auction. No, it's like if you're if you're a, a paid W two employee, and yes, a builder, yes, not just a builder, but any owner. And yeah. If I am the paid salaried, yeah. keyword there is salary, right? My pay is not based on my production. I'm not paid if I close a house, I'm paid just for showing up. I have regular office hours and I show up and I collect a paycheck and that paycheck is paid with a W-2 at the end of the year. I'm a salaried employee of the owner of that property that I can do any of those things. I can buy, sell, lease, list, exchange, auction, all that stuff. And I don't need a license. Everybody got that one? Because that's a, it's a big loophole. The salary employee just of the owner of the, of the owner of the property salary employee of the owner of the property so that's a big one it's a big exemption now be careful when they ask you these kinds of questions is is your child somebody other than yourself if they're grown if they're an adult mm -hmm. yes is your mom somebody other than yourself yeah yes so if you manage your mother's property for a small $50 monthly fee, do you need a license for that? Yes. yes. Absolutely. You're being paid. You're, being, you're doing the job for somebody other than yourself. It requires a license. Does everybody follow that? Would they ever say something like, there's a salary uh, employee for Pan Am that doesn't have his real estate license? Can he sell a license for somebody else because it's not a salary employee of the owner? They ever try to trick you up with that? No, no, give me that one more time. I want to so make just sure. to say someone is like, you know, 
Pan Am's uh, secretary does not have a license, however, is a salaried employee, is selling a property for a client. That's just not a, a client of, of Pan Am? Or, yeah. uh, okay, so, so you're saying you have a real estate firm. Right. Who has, has a salaried employee. Who has a salaried employee of the firm. That's correct. There are certain things they can do. Selling is not one of them. That's correct. Selling is not one of them. I guess what I'm saying is, would they ever try to trip you up in terms of like using salary but not using the salary yes. of the owner? Yes. And we're gonna, so we're going to talk about what, because there are different things that the salaried employee of the owner of the property can do versus the salaried employee of a broker representing the property. Because there are certain things that the salaried, unlicensed employee of a broker can do that would normally require a real estate license as well, but there, that list is not as extensive what they can do as if I'm the direct, so start thinking about degrees of separation. If you're the owner yourself, do you ever need a license to do any of that stuff? No. Right, you don't have to have it. No license required. Because you, you, you fail at the first part of the definition, which is for others, right? Can you pay yourself a commission? Sure, because you're not doing it for others. So owners never need a license to do their own business. So now let's go one degree of separation away from the owner. No. Somebody who's directly employed by the owner. Well, as long as they're directly employed as a salaried W-2 employee, they also don't need a license to do any of those things. Does that make sense? If you go any further away from the owner than that, you need a license. If I'm not the salary W-2 employee of the owner, I need a license in order to work for that owner and be paid compensation in real estate. We're on page 596. But, right? so, has everybody got that? So the exemption is salary W-2 employee of the property owner themselves. Now, I want to talk a little bit further about the exemptions while we're on that subject. And Pablo kind of brought it up when I was going to talk about it. There are such things as salaried assistants to brokers. A broker is free to have a salaried assistant. And that salaried assistant can perform certain functions that ordinarily would require a real estate license if they weren't the salaried assistant of the broker. Like, for example, they can show property, but not all types of property. It's a big distinction here. They can show property that's for rent, but never property that's for sale. So the salary unlicensed assistant of a real estate broker, let's say I am a broker property manager. I can have a salaried, unlicensed assistant who can collect rent, who can take phone calls for repair requests, who can even show potential tenants the available inventory. Because a property manager deals with leasing property, right? And so my unlicensed, salaried assistant can do all of those things for me. Can they balance a the trust account? Absolutely. Who's the real estate commission all responsible for all of their activities, no matter what it is? The broker who employs them. Again, the key here is, in order for this exemption to work, they have to be salaried and they have to be paid on a what? A W-2, not a 1099. 1099s are for independent contractors. If you're paid in real estate on 1099, you need a license. It's as simple as that. If you work in real estate, and you get a 1099 from somebody, you better have a license. That, that's without exception. Okay? So, no showing of for sale properties by the salaried assistant of a broker. Can the salaried assistant of a property owner show properties that are for sale? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yes. So, the salaried assistant of the owner themselves gets more, of, more leeway here. Basically, they can do anything a broker can do. Does everybody follow that? There is no requirement whatsoever for a license for any activity from a brokerage standpoint for the salaried assistant of the property owner. 
but the salaried assistant of a broker representing the property. Would you agree they're a little bit more separated from the bank? They can do some certain things, but not others. So, like for example, like a maintenance man. Um, I'm sorry. Like a maintenance man for a uh, for property management. Well, even just a just a showing agent. You know, you go into an apartment complex. I guarantee you, none of those folks that work in that office are licensed. They're salaried, unlicensed assistants of some broker, property manager somewhere along the way. And then you cannot pay them a commission for. Correct. They can't be paid on performance. They have to be paid an hourly wage or just a straight up salary wet, you know, wage. They're, they're not paid for production. You know, their pay is not based on how many units they sell or how many they rent or how many they because they're ju they're just salaried. Right. That's the key here. Anytime in real estate you're paid for production, you need a license. And that would even be true of the assistant of the owner themselves, because the key there has to be a salaried assistant. No pay for production. Pay for production is commissions. To earn a commission, you've got to have a license. Does that make sense? Do you understand the requirement for a license, number one, and number two, what the exemptions to that requirement are? Right? So if you were asked, what things can the salaried assistant of a broker not do? What would be first on that list? Sell property. Can't. Well, they can't sell, but they can't even what? Show, show property, property that's for sale. sale. Can't even show. So if you're one of these firms that's got a listing out there and it's both for sale and for lease, can your salaried, unlicensed assistant show that property? No. I would say you're walking, you, you've fallen off the razor thin edge at that point. Because here's the thing. Even if that person says, well, I'm looking to rent, and you send that unlicensed person out to show that property because they're looking to rent. What if the question comes up halfway through the show? Well, how much are they selling it for? Now we're showing a for sale listing, right? We just broke, we just violated the law. You see how that could easily happen? So if it's both, no way. It's got to be a broker that shows it. Is everybody with me on that kind of exemption? But the salary, the system of a broker to balance a trust account, there's no requirement for a license to balance a trust account. You can have a bookkeeper. They can answer phone calls in the office. And they can give out information that's readily available publicly. You know, If they want to know what the list price of a property is, if that's readily available on an MLS sheet, they can give them that information. If they want to know how many square feet it is, if that's readily printed out, they can basically read to them anything that's been published by the broker. Can they put information into the MLS as an unlicensed person? Can they put it out there for sale? Yes. But again, who does the real estate commission hold responsible? The broker who employed them. Now that's assuming your MLS allows for unlicensed people to have access and all that stuff, you know, but that's not the real estate commission's concern. That's just, you know, your local board of realtors and all their deal with the MLS. In Raleigh, we are allowed to have an unlicensed assistant. Kim is not licensed. She is an un Leslie's licensed. Kim is not licensed. So Leslie has her own access to the MLS. Kim has an unlicensed admin access to the MLS. But that allows her to upload listings to the MLS. If I allow her to do it. I mean, I have control over that because I can go into her options and choose what she has the ability to do and not do. But if she enters in something wrong, who's responsible for it? Me. Because I employ her as a salaried assistant. Does that make sense? So is this one of the exceptions where you're allowed to give someone the code for the door? No. No. So how does your licensed employee get in and show the houses for rent? Then I would have to have a separate box on there or just give her the key. Okay. I could just give her the key so to have so access. That's cold. There's no exceptions. You right. Don't do no that. exception to that, and that's an MLS rule. That's not a you know real estate commission oh, okay. rule. What he's talking about is when you're a member of the MLS and you go to show property, they give you the code to the lockbox to access the property. You're not allowed, even as the listing agent, to give out that code to anybody who's not a member of the MLS. It's actually considered the lockbox, even though you buy it and you place it. Is considered property of the MLS from the moment you put it on the door and put that listing in the MLS. And then you're only, that code is only supposed to be available to people who are members of the MLS. You're not, so if you have a handyman going over there to do work, it's a violation of their rules to give that handyman that code. 
if you want to, to have those kind of people have access, you have one or two options. You either let them in, well, three options. You let them in yourself, you give them the key so that they can go get in, or you put a second lock box with a different code with another key in it, and you can give them that code. But not the but the one that's in the MLS, the rule is you don't give that code to anybody that's not a member of the MLS. Okay? But is everybody good on these exceptions here for licensure? When you have to have a license. Okay? Now, when you all get a license, what kind of license are you going to have? Provisional license. How many hours of class do you have to take to get to a provisional license? 75. Minimum. 75 hours of a pre-licensing course. Little things like that are important. They might ask you that question on the exam. Many hours of pre-licensing education are required in North Carolina for a real estate license. 75 minimum. We can keep you in here as long as we want to, just 75 minimum. Personally, I don't think you can teach it in 75 hours. Um, I wouldn't pay money to go to a school that ran it in 75 hours because there's no way you can absorb it that quickly, in my opinion. Um, we've done 90 here at UC, you know, it's tough on 90. Uh, it's a big difference. I mean, that's. Uh, so it's a, a tremendous, you know, 15% more hours, and actually about 20% more hours, and still it's tough to get it off. Okay? All right, so provisional brokers, how do they eliminate that provisional status? Take three classes. Take three what kind of classes? Post licensing. Post licensing. You need to know what those classes are called. Because the Real Estate Commission has two separate types of classes. And they're two whole departments, and they don't like for anything to be blurred over from one to the other. That's called job protection, in case you aren't aware. Right? They like to stay separate over there. Different deadlines, different, and this one's going to learn all those deadlines. So, three post-licensing courses. If you want to know the name of them, it's Broker Relationships and Responsibilities, Contracts to Closing, and Selected Topics are the name of the three classes. No, you won't have to know the names of them. But you do need to know there are three separate classes that are 30 hours each in length. They each have a final exam. You must pass all three of them. Within how long? How long after your licensure do you have to get that done? Three years. So can you wait till year three and take all three of them? One every year. Well, in theory you can, but you can't use your license. Because if you want to use your license as a provisional broker, you have to take at least one per year. A minimum of one per year. If you want to have your license be on active status so that you can use it. So in theory, you can take those classes right after the free in license? In theory, you can take them as soon as you get your license card in the mail. And you can, you, at that point, you are not provisional? That's correct. Once you have completed all three of those classes, the provisional status falls off your license and you are a full broker. That's not a real status, it just says broker, but that's kind of how we all differentiate between provisional and broker. We just say full brokers. And you can uh, refer to your referral fee as long as you take one a year? As long as your license is on active status. You can be paid commissions and referral fees are commissions as long as your license is on active status. Okay. So, let's talk about that status. I'm just kind of working on tangents here. We're not really following the book yet, but just kind of working on tangents here. Let's talk about what active status is. Because there are different statuses for your license in North Carolina, and you need to know what each means. Okay? Number one, active means you are current on all of your education requirements and you have paid the $45 annual renewal fee. That's 45. You're current on all of your education requirements and you've paid the annual $45 renewal fee and if you are a provisional broker, you've hung your license with who? A firm, and a firm has who running it? A broker in charge. So the three requirements to be on active status. Your education must be current. That means post-licensing and continuing education. We're going to talk about the continuing education in just a second. 
So all of your education requirements are current. You have met them all, which as a, as a provisional broker means you've taken at least one of those post-licensing classes every year of your licensure. And that runs from anniversary date to anniversary date. So your year starts the day your license is issued. Put that in your notes, because that's not going to be the case for continuing education. Okay. <coughs> Post-licensing deadlines run on your license anniversary date. So if you get your license on May 15th, you have until May 15th of the following year to take your first class. That's your post-licensing course. Okay? So, active status. I'm current on all my education. I have paid the $45 annual renewal. Do you pay it the first year? Just you pay it every year. So, you pay to take the test and you pay the $45 right after? That's your payment for. Yeah. I pay it as part of your application. Part of your application. Where do you Right. You just pay the retail the re, the test retake fee after that. Okay. Is everybody good on that? Current on my education, paid the forty five dollars renewal fee annually. And if I'm a provisional broker, I have my license hung with a broker in charge. What about full brokers? Do they have to have their license hung with a broker in charge? In order for it to be on active status, well, they are a broker in charge. Well, they can be. Right? They're, they're not. No, they're not a broker in charge, they and they may, may or may not can be. Depends, because there are separate requirements, which we'll talk about for being a broker in charge. But let's assume they're not. But they, have the, they have the ability to become a broker in charge. Maybe right? or maybe not. There's requirements they got to meet. Takes time. Exactly. Takes time. So let's assume they're not. Let's assume, like Nick said, they just take the classes, take all three classes, they get rid of the provisional status. Can they have their license on active status without hanging it with a broker in charge, as a full broker? As long as they're current on their education and paid their renewal fee. There's no requirement that a full broker have their license hung with a broker in charge <coughs> in order to be on active status. So, you, yeah, so back to what I said about the referral, you can't do it unless you're done your Unless you've been, you have to be on active status. Right. If you're a provisional broker, that means hanging your license with a broker in charge. Right. If you're a full broker, that means having completed the post license in education. But, and this is a big but, active status does not mean you can actively work, it means you can be paid. That's what active status means. It means your license is available for you to get paid. The type of payment and what you're being paid for will determine whether or not you're doing it the right way or not. And here's what I mean by that. When we went back and we talked about buyer representation and we talked about seller representation, who represents the client? The firm. The firm. Is it possible to be paid as a listing agent if you don't have your license hung with a broker in charge? No, because who represents the client? The firm, and the firm has what running it? A broker in charge. So there's no way for you to be a listing agent without having your license hung with a broker in charge. Does everybody see that? How about a buyer agent? Who represents the buyer? The firm, and the firm has what running it? A broker in charge. Is there any way to be a buyer agent without having your license hung with a broker in charge? No. So what good does it do for these full brokers to be on active status? You can get, you can get referral fees. You get referral fees. A full broker who's on active status. That'd be the only status. reason. That'd be the only reason. So could a full broker like basically have a verbal uh, agreement with a buyer and then when they go to uh, when they go to basically purchase the house, negotiate a like a referral fee from the seller no. agent. No, because the very act of telling somebody you have a real estate license who doesn't already know it incidentally is considered 
re requires you to have your license hung with a broker in charge. You can't have business cards that say broker. Like as a full, you can't solicit. You can't advertise. You can't say to anybody, oh, hey, yes, I have a real estate license. Would you like me to work with you? Unless you have your license hung with a firm. Which makes sense. How do you get a referral? So the referral would be literally ones that fall into your lap. Your sister comes to you and says, and hey, didn't you finish your real estate class? And you say, yeah, but I'm not really doing anything with it. They're like, oh, okay, because we're about to sell our house. You could say, well, I'd be glad to refer you to somebody. Because that literally fell into your lap. Somebody came to you that had knowledge that you have a license and asked for your advice or guidance or something like that. It literally would have to be one that falls into your lap. But if there was ever any email where you, you know, you couldn't go to a party, for example, and walk up and hear somebody talking about selling their property and say, oh, you know, I'd be glad, I, you know, I'm in real estate, but I don't really actively handle stuff in your area, so I'd be glad to refer you to somebody that does. That's considered solicitation, and that requires your license to be hung with a firm. So the only advantage to being a full broker with their license on active status, but not hung with a firm, is the ability to collect what the Real Estate Commission calls incidental brokerage referral fees. Ones that fall in your lap. Now they will occasionally, and I hesitate to even mention this, occasionally look the other way if you represent your mom as a buyer. Your sister as a buyer, never as a seller though. Because the, the very point of <coughs> selling a property is to advertise, right? And so you're holding yourself out as a broker if you advertise the property. But it, the best way for you to think of it is, I can't be paid a commission unless my license is hung with a firm. I can be paid a referral fee that literally falls into my lap if I'm a full broker and on active status but not hung with a firm, but that's all I can do. Can't advertise myself as a broker, can't have business cards, can't have an email signature that says North Carolina real estate licensee, because that's advertising. Is everybody with me on that? So that's active status. Active just means I can get paid. Now, who pays you? Your firm. Always and only. You're not paid directly by buyers or sellers, you're not paid directly by closing attorneys. The only time you would be paid by anybody other than your firm would be the case of that full broker who's on active status who's getting a referral fee. That referral fee would be paid by another real estate firm. You know. Does that make sense? But other than that, your compensation <coughs> always comes directly from your firm. Well, rental income, or those two, three hundred dollar checks that you get goes to the firm? Yes. Yes. Every dollar of compensation that you earn as a real estate broker, if your license is home with a firm, goes through that firm. So you cannot get paid a commission if your license is not home. No, no way. No. Yep. If your license is not home with a real estate firm, you cannot be paid a commission. Is that why so many real estate firms have seventy brokers on there? Yes. Absolutely. Because essentially, essentially, I'm not saying that you couldn't construct some elaborate something where you could earn a living in this business by not having your license hung with a firm. You know, maybe you just know so many people that those, that many referrals fall into your lap. But realistically, you can't get paid on a even somewhat reasonable, you know, regular basis unless your license is hung with a firm. It's just it's just the reality of the business. Now, that doesn't mean for most of those full brokers they could probably do what? Become their own what? Broker in charge. Broker in charge. Hanging your license with a broker in charge doesn't mean it has to be somebody other than yourself. How much does it cost to be a, to be a broker in charge? To be a broker in charge? It doesn't cost anything to be a broker in charge. Classes. I'm sorry? You have, you have to take a 12 hour class that the Real Estate Commission offers one time. Okay? So let's talk about requirements to become a broker in charge. Here's the big one. Two years of active, full-time brokerage experience within the previous five years. Which means? 
Same thing as the requirement for primary residence with capital gains tax, right? Two years of active full-time experience within the previous five years. And that's just active. That's not actually practicing. They, here's what I'll say about that. They have no way of knowing what you're actually doing. As far as it's active status. If it's on active status for two years, you meet the requirement. There's in no, basic terms. There's no transaction number of transaction requirement? No. So you can They don't have any way of checking. They don't have access to the MLS. For two years of active full time employment in the past five years. In the previous five. So your license has to have been on active status for two of the previous five years in order to declare yourself a broker in charge. Well now, if you're gonna declare yourself the broker in charge, you gotta declare yourself the broker in charge of something. What is that something? Firm. It's a firm. Guess what requires a license? Firm. A firm. So there's your cost associated with becoming a broker in charge. Brokers in charge need to be brokers in charge of a firm. Firms are licensed separately than brokers. That means there's a separate annual renewal fee, another $45, if you want to become a firm. You can become a one-person firm. As long as you meet the two years of active, full-time experience requirement within the previous five, you simply fill in a form that says broker in charge declaration. You want to send it, if it's a new firm you're creating, you need to also send a firm license application with it, right? If it's an existing firm, you don't send that because the firm already exists. So there's a, firm called, there's a form called the Broker in Charge Declaration Form, and you declare yourself the broker in charge. How many broker in charge can there be at a firm? One. One. <coughs> question is how many brokers in charge can there be at a firm? One. There can be more than one broker in charge eligible person at a firm, but there is only one broker in charge at a firm. So that, to that once you, if you practice, for, let's just say you have your status active for two years, and yep. you can basically become a broker in charge of your own company for $90, 45 45 Correct. For yourself and the firm, you can have Pablo Rizzo. Correct. Absolutely. Now, there may be other incidental business expenses that go along with that. For example, if you wanted to practice residential real estate, there's a fee for every firm that joins the MLS, which is substantial. Um, so, you know, you have to take those considerations into what is account. It, what is it, like 12 euros a year? Uh, for a firm, yeah. it's 2,500. And then is it, and then you have to pay for an individual? Yes, you're well. separate, the firm is separate from the broker. So, in addition to your membership fees, you have, the firm has its own right. set of fees that must be paid. And so. What people have to weigh is, you know, you know, what, what is the benefit or is the cost going to outweigh the benefit? You know, if I look at the additional fees I'm going to have to pay, plus if you become your own firm, you need your own errors and emissions insurance. I mean, there are a lot of business expenses that flow from this new entity. You know, and so what you have to do as a broker is weigh, you know, how many transactions I do, how much am I paying in commission splits, is that more than or less than, you know, a lot of people well, probably attempt that and then go, whoa, later, if they're not. Some do, yeah, some do. A lot of them say they're going to do it, and they find out what the expenses are going to be that are entailed in it. You know, they don't, and they find. So what they do is they seek out a firm that maybe has more generous commission splits, or, you know, there, there are firms out there that, you know, will give you 90% of commissions, or, you know, even... 95% or, or have just a flat transactional fee for, per transaction, you know, so that you don't have to go through that, that process, you know. So there are a lot of options out there. But the key here is that a broker in charge has to have two years of full-time active experience within the previous five, and then they can declare themselves broker in charge. Now, once you declare yourself broker in charge, here's where the education requirement kicks in for, for a bit. There's a 12-hour class called the Broker in Charge course. It is not offered by real estate schools. It is only offered by the Real Estate Commission. It's the only class they offer. Is this after or before you become broker in charge? After. So you did the 12-hour class, you become a broker in charge, and then you have another 12-hour class. No. No, you become broker in charge. You become broker you in charge, class. and then oh. you take the 12-hour class. 
You have 120 days after you declare yourself broker in charge to take the class. When you say initially before you, that you have two years and you have to take a class that is offered in one day, but am I confused? I'm confused, I guess. I'm not sure. I have, no, it's a day and a half class. A 12 hour class is a day and a half class. But you declare yourself the broker in charge first. You don't have to, but that's the way 99.9% .9 of people do it because they don't make you take the class before you declare yourself broker in charge. Okay. You declare yourself broker in charge, and you have 120 days after that point in time to take the 12 hour class. And this is given by the commission? By the real estate commission. And it focuses on trust accounts and how to manage a trust account, how to balance a trust account, how to, you know, dual agency, designated dual agency, you know, all those things that a broker in charge would need to have a good handle on. Be held responsible for. Exactly. Supervision of provisional brokers, all those kinds of things. Has everybody got that? Okay. So that is the requirement, and that's on the bottom of page 596 and going into 597. The, uh, the definition of broker in charge um, and it talks and it, it tells you the exact you know the 12 hour class has to be taken within 120 days after designation that means after you declare yourself the broker in charge everybody got that so we have three license statuses or three three designations I guess provisional broker full broker broker in charge now, all of those, in order to work, have to be on active status. Remember, we defined what active status was, right? We said current on all your license, your education, you paid your $45 renewal fee annually, and if you're a provisional broker, you've hung that license with a broker in charge. Those are the three requirements to be on active status. Right? Let's talk about another status. What if I don't pay? What if I don't pay the renewal fee? Not inactive. Not inactive. Expired. You need to know that terminology. Expired refers specifically to someone who has failed to pay the renewal fee. I would suggest you make a page with nothing but dates on it because I'm going to give you a bunch of dates that you need to know as it relates to licensure. I would just put, you know, dates to remember for license rules. So expired status is just... You did not pay the renewal fee for either a firm or a broker. Both firms and brokers can be on expired status. It's just like your own choice. It's That's exactly right. If you don't renew it, it expires. You don't have it anymore. That's exactly right. I will tell you that expired is much more dangerous than inactive. You can stay inactive forever and keep your license. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh. You can stay inactive forever and keep your license as long as you keep paying the $45 every year. You may have to take some classes when you come back, but you will have a license waiting for you. If you stay expired for more than 18 months, you don't have a license anymore. So, it is very dangerous to go expired. So pay the $45. It's too hard to get it, to lose it over $45. So what happens if you lose it? Do you have to take this class again? Start over. If you don't pay for 18 months. <laughs> you don't pay for 18 months. So they know how to get their money. <laughs> so your date that you're going to give us today, you got technically 18 months to pay $45? 18 months after the payment deadline. So here's the first date that goes on your page, on your dates to remember sheet. Hold on, hold on. You must renew your license every year by June 30th. That is the renewal deadline. It is the same for every licensee in the state. That includes firms and brokers. Firms are licensees too. Was it June 21st? June 30th. June 30. The license year cycle is July 1 through June 30. You must renew by June 30. I know I asked you before, weeks ago, so if you get your license in May, you have to renew June 30th? Correct. You renew every June 30th. If you get your license on June 29th, you renew on June 30th. Hold on. Whoa. You say we're waiting? Sorry. We will be waiting. 
that CE. There's no waiver of the money. No waiver of which, the money. Which this is the fee that you're going to pay when you do the test. Correct. Right. But so here's the thing. Y'all are going to take your test in what April, right? You get your license in April. You won't have to renew in June. They will so charge you a renewal so that fee. Forty-five dollars. No, for twelve months is going to be for two months for us. Right? Correct. And they don't prorate. You renew every June 30th. No later than June 30th. Bill. They send you a, a, a reminder card. Um, uh, I, I think it's either this year or next year they're not going to send paper reminder cards anymore. They're going to do an email. Um, they finally have opened it up where we can pay it online. Um, now you can pay your renewal online. They don't open it up till May. Usually it's the 1st of May that they open it up for renewal. So I just remind myself, you know, first week of May every year I go in there and pay it. Just, you know, pay mine and pay the firms. Actually, all three firms plus mine. Pan real, pan real, commercial, pan real, from Lakeside. Well, cool. May, do you pay it one firm? I do. Okay. Right. Because they open it. Because I don't, they open the payment up on third. Yeah. Is everybody all right in that? June 30th, the deadline to renew your license. If you do not renew your license, what's your license status? Expired. Expired. Good. Now, let's talk about some other deadlines. Your post licensing deadline, I already mentioned that. What is your post licensing deadline annually? Anniversary. Your license anniversary day. It is the only thing tied to the day you are issued a license. Is your, your post licensing deadline is tied to the date you were issued a license. So that deadline is different for everybody. That means the post licensing classes pretty much have the same number of people in them year round because it, everybody's deadline is different. That is not true for the other type of education you have to take. Continuing education. In addition to post licensing, every broker, and that includes provisional ones, is required to take eight hours of continuing education every single year. Eight hours of continuing education every year. Four hours of that is what's called the mandatory update. You don't get to choose that class. It's written by the Real Estate Commission. It's taught by people like me, but it's not my class. I get it from the Real Estate Commission. I teach what's in it. It's what they want you to know every year. That's four hours of it. The other four you get to pick. You get to choose what's called an elective class for the other four hours. When do you think you have to have your CE taken? When's the license year? June 30th would make sense, right? If June 30th would make sense, it would be also much easier, but it's not June 30th. July 30th. It's June 10th. The CE deadline is June 10th. So it's the one you were saying you have to close the doors every year? Exactly. So what you can predict is that what's about to happen with CE classes right now? They're about to get really full. As a matter of fact, of the 55,000 active licensees in the state of North Carolina, as of last week, 48,000 of them have not yet taken their CE. Yeah, it's that way every year. Every year. And conveniently, Travis's classes get more expensive the closer we get to June 10th. We start at $45, and then they go $47.50, and then they're $50, and, then they're, and on June 10th, they're $65. And they're full. And, full. <laughs> and I have zero sympathy for them. I'm going to, you know, that point. Cash. <laughs> exactly. You charge 250 dollars <laughs> Sometimes I think you could, you know. So there, here's the reason it's June 10th and not June 30th. They have 55,000 of these to process, right? If you haven't taken your CE by June 30th, your license goes inactive. But they need some time to see who took it and who didn't. You know, to, because you have report, you know, it's got to be reported to them. So they need time to update the license records and all that stuff. So theoretically, you could do it much faster than this now. They could probably push it out to June 25th and still be okay. This June 10th is the remnant of when it was all done on paper, but it's still the rule, okay? They don't allow us to offer any classes from June 10th, from June 11th through the 30th. We cannot offer classes, CE classes. We can teach post-licensing or 
pre-licensing, but no CE from June 11th through the 30th. It's just not allowed. So what date do we need to know that June 10th? June 10th. June 10th is a day. That's not when your license is going to go inactive, though. When is your license going to actually go inactive if you don't take the class? Go the next day. July 1st, when the new license year starts. So July 1st is when your license will go expired if you don't pay the renewal fee. July 1st is when your license will go inactive if you don't take your CE. So you get this nice 20-day waiting period where you know your license is going to go inactive and you can't do anything about it. And that's fun. I can't tell you how many people we get to call us on June 14th and say, I haven't taken my CE, I need to take it or my license is going to go inactive. Yeah, it is. Well, when can I take, when's your next class? July 1. Well, my license will be inactive by then. Yeah, it will. So it's inactive on July 1, it's not expired on July 1? Inactive, okay. exactly. Expired is only if you don't pay the money. That's why this terminology stuff is so important. So you, so you, you can pay the money in May, but you never took your you class. You don't take your classes. Your license is going to go inactive. It's not expired. That's right. You're not going to expire as long as you paid the money. Remember, I said you can go inactive forever. You can just decide, I'm not going to take the classes. I don't want to practice. I'm not going to use my license. But I want to keep it in case I ever want to use it in the future. You can just decide, I'm not going to take the CE. I'm not going to take the post license. So inactive is not up to date with the courses. Inactive is one of several reasons you can be inactive. The primary being I'm not up to date on my education. You can also just declare yourself inactive. You can also be up to date on your education and be a provisional broker and still be inactive for what reason? You have to take your uh, three classes. No, you're up to date. You've taken all your post you take you've taken the post license that's required. You've been taking all three because you're still provisional. So I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to have been taking one. I've taken that one. I've taken my CE. But my license is still inactive. What could that be if I'm a provisional broker? I don't have it hung with a broker in charge. Remember, a provisional broker can't activate their license unless it's hung with a broker in charge. So inactive can be one of several things. Inactive means you haven't taken a class you're supposed to take. Or you're a provisional broker and you don't have your license hung with a broker in charge, or you just declared yourself inactive for whatever reason. So as soon as you pass your third class test, you now be able to be active. You have to file a form that makes you active. Okay. Declares you active. But yes, you have so the ability. On you. On yes, it's on you. They're not going to automatically update your license status to active. But you can declare yourself active <laughs> the day after you finish. Finish. Does everybody got that? So expired means I haven't paid the money. Inactive could be I haven't taken a class I was supposed to take. So I, I passed my first license anniversary as a provisional broker and I didn't take a post license class. What's going to happen to my license? Inactive. It's going to go inactive. I passed June 10th and I don't take my CE. What's going to happen to my license? It's going to go inactive. I am a provisional broker, and my broker in charge fails to take his or her CE. What's going to happen to my license? It's going to go inactive because my license has to be hung with a broker in charge, right? So when theirs goes inactive, so will mine. We would hope that we would find somebody to step into that broker in charge role sometime between June 11th and June 30th, right? Because remember, the broker in charge didn't take their class. Their license is going to remain active all the way through June 30th. We would hope somebody would recognize, hey, the BIC didn't take their classes. We need somebody else to be the BIC. Because what would also go inactive on July 1 if the BIC has not taken their CE? Everybody. The firm's license would go inactive on July 1. What happens when the firm who represents all the clients has their license go inactive? It ain't good. They don't represent the clients anymore. The clients are released from all of those contracts because the firm doesn't exist to do business as a real estate firm. So here's what would happen if you had a big who didn't take their CE. On July 1, the big's license goes inactive, the firm's license goes inactive. That means you can declare a new person the broker in charge and reactivate the firm license but you would have to re-sign every listing agreement, every buyer agent agreement, and if they want it out, you can't force them to re-sign. 
It also means every provisional broker who's in that firm, their license falls inactive. It also means every broker in that firm has to resubmit their broker affiliation form to say what firm they are affiliated with because that all goes away when the firm's license goes inactive. Pain in the rear end. Don't let it happen. Uh, just don't let it happen. Um, so the broker in charge definitely should take your CE early and be done with it to make sure because the firm's license is predicated on your license. The firm has to have a broker in charge at all times. Does everybody follow how that would you know, kind of ripple down effect would work? So if you go inactive for 10 years? Mm -hmm. Just because you don't. Because you don't want to do it. Um, when you come around the next year, you just have to take that current year's educational contract. Usually they make you take two years worth. Usually they no make matter how much time you've been active, two years. Two years worth, so 16 hours. Um, Continuing education. One, the one for that year, which is the four years. With the mandatory update. The mandatory update. And plus three elected. Plus months. three elected. Right. Exactly. That's usually what they make you take. And that's any time you're inactive. Even if you forget to take this year's seat. Say you've been taking seat every year. And you forget to take it by June 10th of this year. When July 1 rolls around, if you want to reactivate your license, you got to take the new mandatory update for that next license year, plus probably three elective classes, because you have to take the eight hours you missed last year, plus they're going to make you take this year's in advance now to, to reactivate. So almost any time your license falls in active, you're probably going to have to take 16 hours worth of CE to reactivate. Does everybody follow that? And if you're the broker in charge and you forget to do that, you have to go, once you get your license back active, you have to go retake that 12-hour class, except this time you don't get the 120 days. You have to take it before you could reactivate yourself as a broker in charge. So a broker in charge that forgets to take their CE, they can count on 16 hours worth of CE to reactivate their license, plus another 12 hours of the broker in charge class, which they don't offer all the time to reactivate their license. And oh, by the way, they don't always get us the new mandatory update on July 1 either. <laughs> Last year it was July 28 when we got it. That means anybody who went inactive for failing to take their CE the year before, they were inactive for the whole month of July and there was nothing they could do about it. I can't imagine there are many partners in charge who missed that deadline. Or is that going to be a surprise? Oh, well, I'm surprised any of them do. Right. Um, but there's, there's always, a, it, usually it's the, the ones that miss it are the ones who are their own broker in charge. Yeah. You know, the, it's the one-man show type thing. And so that, the Real Estate Commission doesn't really keep separate statistics of, they just keep brokers in charge versus brokers, mm -hmm. you know. And there's always a couple thousand brokers in charge that miss it every year. But my guess is the vast majority of them are people who don't have anybody but themselves. Yeah. Yeah, but I have known brokers in charge of big firms who forget. They think they took, or they take the update twice because, you know, they don't want to sit through eight hours of CE in one day, so they split it up into two days and they think, oh, I'll take the update here and I'll come back later and take the, the broker in charge annual review later on. Well, they end up taking the update twice because they think they took the other one. You know, they forget which one they took. So they took eight hours, but it wasn't the eight hours they needed. So... The other thing is, you can lose that broker in charge eligibility too. You know, we, we've had people, um, you know, we've, we've had people that don't, for whatever reason, they aren't practicing and they, they keep their broker in charge eligibility, but they, they don't actively practice, so they don't have the two years worth of active full-time experience in the previous five. But as long as you continue to take the classes along the way, you keep that status. If you get to take the class one time, now all of a sudden you want to regain that broker in charge status. You've got to go hang your license with somebody for two years because you don't have it anymore. You know, you don't have that. So there's all kinds of things that negative consequences that can come from not meeting those deadlines. So deadline for renewal is what? June 30th. June 30th. That's the deadline is June 30th. You go, in, you go expired on July 1. Okay? Deadline for taking continuing education is what? June 10th, you go inactive on what day? July 1. Okay. Deadline for taking your post licensing is what? 
your particular anniversary date every year. You have to take a minimum of how many? One per year. All those post licensing are one time, you're done with them, you never take them again. That's it, unless you get punished for something. Okay. They use them as punishment classes too. Okay. Like, you know, I said if you go expired for more than 18 months, you lost your license. If you go expired for six months, they make you pay the reinstatement fee plus take one of the post licensing classes. If you go expired for uh, 12 months, they make you pay the um, reinstatement fee plus take two of the post licensing classes. Classes. Sometimes they make you take all three of the post licensing classes, even if you've already taken them. So if you don't renew your date of the licensee of June 30th, you go expired as of June 30th. As of July 1. As of July 1. Mm -hmm. New and license. And you go inactive as of July 1 if you don't get your post licenses before by June 10th. So we're continuing education. Mm -hmm. continuing education. Post licensing is tied to your anniversary date. Continuing education is June 10th. The expiration date for the 18 mark as June 30th. It would be, uh, uh, let's see, it would be the following, what, December, end of December of the, next year. Of the following year. Right. What's that one? I'm sorry. He was asking, like, how, how long you could be, you don't have to know that day. Yeah, um, he was asking, like, how long you could be expired and still be able to come back without having to retake the whole thing. But if you did the math, it would be basically December of the following year. All right. Um, let's see, what else do we need to talk about about those? Uh, Deadlines. So, if I don't take one year of post licensing by my first anniversary date, I'm inactive. If I haven't taken two years of post licensing by my second anniversary date, I'm inactive. If I haven't taken all three by my third, I'm inactive. Okay? Uh, I can always take those and cure that deficiency and make it back up. Let's talk about provisional brokers and continuing education. Because we know the provisionals have to take post licensing. Do provisionals have to take continuing education as well? The answer is yes but you get your first license year for free. Not your first anniversary year, your first license year. What did I say the license year schedule was? July 1. July 1 through June 30th. You get your first license year for free. When are you all gonna get your license if you pass? April. April. When is your first license year in? June 30th, there's your free year from April to June, oh. right there. So when would your first, if you get your license in April of 2014, when is your first CE deadline going to be? June 10th of what? 15th. June 10th of 15th. So this is our CE for the year. Exactly. So think of it this way. The second June 10th you have a license, that's your deadline. That's your first CE deadline, and every June 10th after that. So the second time you go past June 10th with a license, that's your deadline. Well, obviously June 10th of 14 would be your first time. June 10th of 15 is going to be your deadline for CE. Everybody follow that? If you get your license on June 9th, your free year is that day. Generally, they do not issue licenses in June unless you specifically ask them. Most of the time, if you pass the test anywhere past about May 15th, they will call you and say, we can issue your license now. If we do, you're going to have to renew by June 30th. <laughs> or you can wait, we'll issue your license on July 1. You know, they give you the option. Then you request, you just wait. If it's April. You just don't apply. Oh, you know, yeah. But in general, no, you cannot request. If you go ahead and take the exam, they're going to issue it now. Okay. You're taking the exam, is the application? Yes. That's right. Because you submit the application before you take the exam. And you don't get permission to take the exam until after they process the application. And you don't have to reapply every exam? No, no. Just you just reschedule. Take you just reschedule. You have 108. Your, Permission to take the exam is good for 180 days. Zero opinion. It's good for 180 days, right. Is everybody good on those dates? Because they're important, they will test you on them. Okay. Good on that. Make sure you know that you know, CE and post licensing are two different things with two different deadlines and all that good stuff. Okay. Um, we've kind of covered the activities uh, requiring a license for business entities. Basically, anything 
other than a person doing brokerage business requires a separate firm license. So Ann Scott, broker, does not require a firm license. Right? I'm Ann Scott, I'm a broker. That doesn't require a firm license. Unless she wants to represent clients. And then you'd have to, because only firms can represent clients. But Ann Scott Realty is an entity that requires a firm license. So if you start calling it something other than yourself, that requires a firm license. You know, may, and it could very well, even, and you won't be tested on this, but just to give you an idea of what I mean here, if you do business in some name other than your firm's name, maybe you are the Ann Scott team at Keller Williams Realty, they may require you to get a firm license because that the Ann Scott team is an entity doing business, not just Ann Scott doing business. Does that make sense? So just keep that in mind. Basically, anytime you start using a name other than your own personal name, you probably don't have to have a firm license for it. In general, yeah. Well, not necessarily. You just hang your license. If you just hang your license with a firm, you're not you're just going to have the 45 annual renewal for yourself. You, know, you would only need that separate firm licensure. No, I'm talking about for this class in general. Oh, as far as renewing, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're in a time year. of year where you're going to do it twice. Exactly. Just be prepared to, you know, you'll get your license, and two weeks later you'll get your renewal notes. Right. You know, this, this, this is going to be the way it'll be. All right. Okay, um, we've already talked about the exemptions, which are on page 598, but please do read through those. I want to talk about one other exemption that I haven't talked about yet. Remember the exemptions for licensure, like salaried employee of the owner of the property or salaried employee of a broker. Um, those are the exemptions. Um, the other big one is number three on page 598, an attorney who's an active member of the state bar, but only when they're performing an act or service that constitutes practice of law. Not when they're engaged in real estate brokerage. So, an attorney who's doing something that's considered the practice of law does not need a real estate license. We'll give you an example of something that would be the practice of law. Being the executor of an estate, probating an estate, is considered the practice of law. Do estates have things that need to be sold? Mm -hmm. Could some of those things be real property? Mm -hmm. yeah. Could the attorney be paid a fee for selling that real property? Mm -hmm. Are they required to have a real estate license to do that? Right. No. But could the same attorney, in conversation with the daughter of the deceased person, list the daughter's house for sale and be paid a commission without a real estate license. No, do you see the difference between the two? So if, they have, if they're selling the real property as a part of some legal service that they're rendering, they don't have to have a license for that, a real estate license. They have to have a law license. Only for the real property, I mean for the uh, personal property. I'm sorry? Only for the personal property? What do you mean only for the personal property? I said if they're selling you say if they're selling real property, real property I'm sorry, yeah. as part of some legal service, yeah. like probating an estate, okay. then they don't need a real estate license to sell that real property and be paid a fee for it, because it's called a fee at that point, not a commission. But they can't. that doesn't mean they can just go out and sell real estate and earn commissions without a real estate license. If they're just practicing brokerage, they still need a real estate license. And that's because there's only people that can probate that. Yeah, I mean, it's because they've been hired. They can't require them to have a license for that thing. That it, it, in, in essence, it, what, they've been, what they're saying here is that they can't perform the job they've been hired to perform as an attorney unless you give them the freedom to sell that property. And we're not going to require them to go get this other license just because that may be incidental to this thing. What, um, what about closing attorneys? What about them? Do they need real estate license? No. No. No, any attorney. I mean, that's. I mean, it's it's just like a real estate broker. We're allowed to practice in any area of real estate as long as we feel that we are um, uh, capable of practicing in that area. We don't have separate licensure for, you know, for commercial and for residential. It's all one license. 
So it's, you know, because the attorney, it's the attorney's responsibility to only practice in areas of law that they're comfortable in. Uh, just like it's a broker's responsibility to only practice in areas of real estate you're comfortable in. Um, I do want to talk about a type of license that we have not mentioned to this point, and uh, I'm going to back up a page here. Um, the limited non-resident commercial license. It's on page 597, left column, first paragraph down there. You may see some mention of that on the state exam portion. Because commercial real estate is much more of a national thing, we give commercial brokers a lot more leeway about licensure. It is very common for a commercial broker in dealing with only one client to have to cross several state lines. That, you know, if I'm dealing with one buyer, I may be in five, six different states at one time with that buyer. To facilitate that, every state has come up with this way of cooperating with each other to essentially allow you to use your Georgia license in North Carolina when dealing with a commercial client or your North Carolina license in Maryland when dealing with a commercial. But only commercial is the key here only commercial and you have to have a North Carolina broker who is willing to be responsible for you. It sort of becomes like broker in charge with a provisional broker. So if I take up some broker from Virginia comes to me and says, look, I have a buyer in Raleigh. I want to represent them. Will you sponsor me as a, a non-resident commercial broker? And I say yes. Well, number one, I will charge them something. I'm not going to let them do it for free. Number two, if they screw up, the Real Estate Commission can't hold them responsible because they don't have a North Carolina license. So who would they hold responsible? Me, because I sponsor them. Does that make sense? So that is allowed as long as they have a license in good standing from any other state and as long as a North Carolina broker is willing to sponsor them for that transaction, that they can come into North Carolina and work here they have to be not a resident of North Carolina. If their permanent residence is in North Carolina, they have to get a North Carolina license. Because we've had people who try to you know, move to North Carolina and they don't want to go through the process of getting a North Carolina license and so they use this limited, you know, it, no, if, you, if, your li if your license is based in another state, then your address has to be based in that state as well for this to work. And it never can be done in residential real estate. That's why it's called a limited non-resident. Yeah, there is a separate fee with the Real Estate Commission. They have to pay a, an application fee uh, and a renewal fee and all that sort of thing. But, uh, um, but is yeah, an average just sort of industry standard for like a referral, a residential referral? 25% uh, is very common. 25% of what you get? Right, of the, of the so on a buyer side, you know, referral, 25% of the buyer side commission. On the seller side, 25% of the seller side listing commission. Yeah, right, exactly. Most of the time you're looking at two and a half to three percent on one side of the transaction, so 25 percent of that would be a pretty standard referral fee. Relocation companies usually charge 35 percent for theirs. Um, 25 is the most common. Okay, are we good on that limited non resident license deal there? Okay, good. Um, the real estate commission itself. On page 598, teach you how to remember these numbers. Nine three two seven eleven. Write that down in notes. Put real estate commission equals nine three two seven eleven. How many members of the real estate commission are there? Nine. There are nine members of the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. How many of them must have a real estate license? Three must have a North Carolina real estate license. How many of them cannot have a license and cannot be in any way involved in the real estate industry in North Carolina? Two. Are they called independent members? Or? 
they're just at large members that are appointed, but they but they cannot they can't be appraisers, they can't be bankers, loan officers, real estate brokers. They can never have held a real estate license. They have to be completely unaffiliated with the real estate industry in the state. So there's so nine real estate commissioners. In nine commissioners. Three must have a real estate license. A minimum of three. You can certainly have more. Two must not have a real estate license. And this is North Carolina. This is North Carolina real estate. Commission. Two must not. Two must not. Now, why is that? they got to have somebody on the other side of the... Like they, basically, you want a voice to protect the consumers. You know, they want somebody who's unaffiliated with the industry who will bring an outside perspective that is designed to protect consumers. That's the idea behind it. Nine commissioners. Three must have a real estate license. Two cannot have. So most of the time what you end up with is seven that have a real estate license and two that don't. You know, just FYI. Because these are minimum numbers, right? Usually seven of the nine do have a real estate license. Or are appraisers or some way related to the real estate industry. Seven of them are appointed by the governor and they, they serve three year terms, which are staggering. So they don't all come on and off at the same time. Seven appointed by the governor, and then one each by the North Carolina House of Representatives and the North Carolina Senate. These are unpaid appointed positions. Senate and North Carolina? House of Representatives and North Carolina Senate. Seven by the governor, one by the House of Representatives, one by the Senate. So they're unpaid? Unpaid. Real estate commissioners are unpaid. They're paid travel and per diem expenses for days they have to travel to Raleigh for meetings and that sort of thing. But so the, the position point? itself is unpaid. What's the point? Like public service. Public service. The power. Really? Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> so they want you to do this? I, I didn't say that. Yeah, I said did. I was asked if I had ever thought about it. Were you asked by the governor of the house? No, the I was not asked by any of those entities. <laughs> I did not get a phone call from Pat. The ones that are unpaid, are the one and one or all of them? I'm sorry? The ones that are not paid, unpaid. Unpaid, all of them. All nine. I'm going to go ahead and assume all nine are fairly well off, though. Generally Even speaking, though they're generally speaking, they are very successful real estate people. Yeah. And usually the ones that are the the unlicensed people are the ones appointed by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Most of the time. That's usually been the case. Oh, and of it, those? The two that have to be unlicensed mm -hmm. are usually coming from the Senate and the House of Representatives, and it's usually somebody who is a member of the House of Representatives or the Senate at that particular point in time. So it's almost like being put on a committee. You know, right. you know how you know if you're in the House of Representatives or the Senate, you're placed on all these committees. Well, think of the Real Estate Commission as their version of a committee. You know, so they the one they appoint is usually from their ranks. There's your unaffiliated people. The seven that are appointed by the governor are usually people very involved in real estate in North Carolina. Currently, there are three instructors on the Real Estate Commission. We've never had that. That's a, an interesting turn of events. And the commissioner, is there a commissioner? No, they're just nine. Oh, okay. There are nine. I mean, there's a chairman, currently Vic right. Knight, who's an appraiser from Chapel Hill. Right. Um, but uh, they're, they're, they don't have a commissioner. Now, these people are separate from the Real Estate Commission staff members. Those are the people who work in the building over on Navajo Drive who issue your license, who, you know, deal with renewals and classes and all the mechanics of making the whole thing work. And they have, they're you know, paid. I'm, they're paid. They're very much paid. They're full-time. It's their full-time job. And they have an executive director who's currently Mir Miriam Baer and director of license and education, director of legal affairs, and they have auditors and investigators and licensing agents and information services people and IT people and it's just like any other company. You know? 
and receptionists and you name it. And and I'm gonna, assuming they're all licensed or does it matter? Um, most everybody that works for the commission is licensed. There are certain positions over there like reception where you don't have to be licensed, but the vast majority of them it is a requirement that they have a broker's license, which is only an active status. They're not, they're not allowed to use it. They have to have one, they're not allowed to use it. I've actually had several, um, I've never had anybody who was going to work for the commission in a pre-licensed class. I've had several in post-licensing classes though who were hired as auditors and they had to get a license, you know, they didn't have it previously, uh, and then they had to get a real estate license and they came to us and took their post license and stuff. I've had several of those. And they're just paying for it, you know, I Correct. Correct. Because their license is only an active status. Everybody got that? So that's the makeup of the commission itself. Those are the, those are the people who make the rules. The staff are the people who enforce the rules. You know, the whole mechanics of the when we say the real estate commission, we generally refer to the staff. You know, the, the 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 people that are you know running the thing on a day-to-day -day basis. These people are simply there to vote on rules. You know, they get presented with you know certain provisions of rules that the staff would like to see enacted, and they vote on those things. Um, they are there to. Um, uh, hear disciplinary cases. You know, the Real Estate Commission staff would start an investigation, would conduct an investigation, would do an audit. They would prosecute the case, but it would be the Real Estate Commissioners who would hear the case and who would vote yes or no, this is somebody we're going to discipline or not discipline. But they are the rule makers. They meet once a month. These are the rule makers. These are the rule makers, and they meet one time a month. And that's an open public hearing. You're welcome to go. If you want to be really bored, you can go sit down on the Real Estate Commission meeting. So usually on the first Wednesday of every month. I believe it is. It's always a Wednesday. Which means I'm always teaching, so I never can go. Bummer. Bummer, yeah. <laughs> okay. So those back to the makeup of the commission. Now, what authority do they have? We've talked about this before. What can they not do, number one? Fine. They cannot fine licensees. They can take away what they gave you in the first place, which is what? Your license. And they do that through either reprimand, censure, suspension, or revocation. Reprimand and censure are pretty much the same thing. That means don't do that again. We're going to put your name in the book and embarrass you. We get a bulletin so, every three months how long that has five, a disciplinary case. Those are the 500 for the. Uh, those aren't licensees. Right, those are. Timeshare developers. Time share developers. That's the only time they can find. And the commissioner can find them. The real estate commission has the power to find. They have been given that authority by the North Carolina General Assembly. They have been given the authority to find timeshare developers. Not the brokers who work for the developers, but the developer themselves. That's five hundred dollars per. Five hundred dollars per violation with no max. Okay. So the power they have: reprimand, censure, suspend, revoke. Those are their powers. Okay. Remember that. Violating license law is also a violation of, or can be a violation of criminal law in North Carolina. That does not mean the Real Estate Commission can send you to jail. What they can do is refer your case over to the district, the district attorney in your county, or a state's attorney, depending on the case. You know, if they feel like you've defrauded someone, they may take disciplinary action, they may investigate, they may revoke your license, and then they could refer your case over to your, the district attorney in your county. It would be up to that district attorney whether or not to actually prosecute you for a crime and send you to jail. But if you violate license law, that's probably also going to be a violation of criminal law at some level. Whether or not you get prosecuted for it, who knows, that's up to the DA. Most times not. Most times not. Okay. As far as prohibited acts, I don't think we need to 
well, maybe we need to do it. Maybe we do. Misrepresentation and omission are the biggest prohibited acts by the Real Estate Commission. And they come in e either willful or negligent forms. Make sure you are okay with being able to tell the difference between a misrepresentation and an omission. What's a misrepresentation? Lying. It's a lie. I, as a broker, have said something, typed something, emailed something that was incorrect. What's an omission? I'd left out something that I should have said, right? I didn't say. So the first thing you have to decide on those kinds of test questions is, did the broker say something that was wrong? If they did, it's got to be a misrepresentation. If they didn't say anything at all, it's got to be an omission. And then the second thing you have to decide is, is it willful or is it negligent? Willful means they knew they were wrong when they screwed up. Whether they were didn't say anything or did say anything, if it's a willful omission, that means I knew I was supposed to be disclosing that. I knew there was a problem, and I actively chose not to disclose it. That's a willful omission. A willful misrepresentation is I knew the thing that was coming out of my mouth was a lie when I said it, and I still did it anyway. That's what willful means. It means you did it on purpose. Okay? Negligent means you forgot. You didn't know. But you should have. So a, will, a negligent omission would be, I left it out, I should have disclosed it, but the reason I didn't disclose it is I didn't even know I was supposed to be disclosing it. I should have known to disclose it, but I didn't. That's a negligent omission. A negligent misrepresentation is, I answered your question, I answered it wrong, I didn't know I was wrong, sorry, I haven't screwed up, I gave you the wrong answer, my bad, but I didn't know I was lying to you. I didn't lie to you on purpose, I told you something wrong, but didn't know any better. That's a willful, I mean, a, a negligent misrepresentation. Is everybody good on those? I'm sure. Yep. On the ones that we did for practice, you know, when they said that the um, the broker didn't do like their own inspection, they took the owner's word for it. Mm -hmm. Are those aren't willful then? What's the definition of willful? They lied. No, that is not. Lie has nothing to do, and that's why everybody misses these test questions. The lying has nothing to do with willful or negligent. The lie has to do with what? No, no. Lie has to do with misrepresentation, period. End of freaking discussion. Lie is misrepresentation. You can lie knowingly. You can lie innocently. It's still a misrepresentation. If I say something that is wrong, it's a misrepresentation. Whether I knew it was wrong or didn't know it was wrong doesn't matter. It's a misrepresentation. Whether I knew it was wrong or didn't know it was wrong determines which piece of it, willful, willful, willful or negligent. So now, what's the definition of willful? Um, they, they did it wrong they did it. Yes, so now go back to your previous question. You said that the owner told them, mm -hmm. right? Right. What was the next thing you said? They didn't know it was wrong. Stop. Okay. Now, answer your own question. Is it willful or negligent? It's negligent. Because, because they what? They, the owner told them. No. Okay. What's the key it's phrase there? They it didn't, didn't know. know. Right. That's negligent. So it they doesn't didn't. matter that they're supposed to go get it. Exactly. None of that matters because all of the did they not know. They did not know makes it negligent. Okay. The fact that they said something that was wrong makes it a misrepresentation. It is a negligent misrepresentation. Okay. The very definition of negligence is something you didn't do but you should have. Something you didn't know but you should have, right? So anytime you can fill in the phrase, they should have, it's negligence. Don't get that confused. We so often on tests see people that confuse the lie with willful. They think anytime somebody said something wrong, it has to be willful. No, it doesn't. You can answer a question incorrectly and not do it on purpose. Does the dishwasher work? Oh, sure, the dishwasher works. I don't have any idea if the dishwasher works. Did I run the damn dishwasher? <laughs> A negligent misrepresentation is simply answering a question that you don't know the answer to. 
and you, have, you got a 50 50 chance and you guess wrong. That's what a negligent misrepresentation is, right? It's still a misrepresentation because I said yes, the dishwasher works and it doesn't. But I didn't know that. What I should have said is I don't know, right? That's another way to know if you're dealing with negligence. You'd have just been better off saying I don't know, right? Whereas with willful, they did know. They can't say I don't know because that would be a lie. Just that would be a willful misrepresentation because they do know. So if like you buy a house and in the listing it says comes with wash and dry, and then the day before the closing you go and there's no wash and dry there. Right. You can apply. That's a misrepresentation. Right. So is that we don't know if it's willful or negligent. Does that give you grounds to terminate the contract? Sure. But, but you said it was in the listing, you didn't say it was in the contract. I'm assuming it made its way into the contract. And that's a good point. That's a really good point. It has to make its way into the contract. And the listing is not the, the agreement between the buyer and the seller. But if the contract calls for the wash and dry to be there, it's not there, sure, that's a reason to terminate. Keep in mind, probably not a good reason to terminate, though, because there's going to be a lot of money that the buyer's expended that they're not going to get back. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just saying in theory. But even in theory, yes. Everybody good on that? So make sure you check over the willful and negligent omission and misrepresentation stuff, because it will bite you. I've seen it too many times. It's one of those things. That and life mistakes. Always up. Do they usually stick to test, uh, a couple of these in a row or are they scattered? Very scattered. There's no sections. There are no sections. Right. And even on the state exam, when you have a national portion and the state portion, they're not broken into sections. The only way you know you're on the, st the state section is when the question starts with, in North Carolina, you know that's one of those 40 that are in the state section. You know, if you're on the HUD section, you know you're in the state section because that's, that's part of the state section. So I assume if, if we get a, a question for misrepresentation or omission, there will never be a case where the question's answer is the broker's not at fault. It will always no, be No, yeah, it's always going to be one of the four. The four choices are always going to be negligent misrepresentation, willful misrepresentation, negligent okay. omission, or okay. willful omission. Those are always going to be the four okay. answer choices on one of those. Yeah, there's no, none of the above. Okay. Yeah, on the, thankfully. So on the class test, is this information included on the classroom? Yes, it is. It is. The class test, even though it's scored as one, mm -hmm. does bring in all the national and the state information. Yes, it does. Okay. So we're good on, there's two, two and a half pages here of negligent versus willful misrepresentation versus omission. I really suggest you read those examples. Keeping in mind that the Real Estate Commission writes the 40 questions on the state part of the exam. Those examples might be very indicative of the kinds of things you would see as um, omission versus uh, misrepresentation. So I would really recommend you read those examples there. Um, other things that are prohibited, making false promises, obviously. Um, Undisclosed dual agency on page 602. That's a big no-no. Remember, dual agency is defined as any time you represent both the buyer and the seller at the same time in the same transaction. Anytime the firm represents both the buyer and the seller at the same time in the same transaction. So we have to do that in a disclosed manner with the permission of both parties. What kind of permission? Written, Written permission once we have what on the table? An offer. Can we have oral permission previous to that? Yes. yes, we can. We can get oral permission for dual agency prior to making an offer, but we have to put it in writing at the time of offer, or later than the time of offer. Same thing for oral buyer agency. We can represent buyers with an oral agreement, but we have to put it in writing no later than the time of offer. Okay. Um, let's see. Talk about self-dealing, I don't think here. <laughs> Page 603, uh, improper commissions. Um, again, it says we cannot be paid by any entity other than our firm. Um, you can't pay somebody. It gives examples as payment by brokers of commissions to previously licensed sales associates who failed to properly renew their licenses uh, for any acts after their license had expired. Now, that leaves the door open. It says, 
cannot pay somebody whose license is expired for any act they perform after their license expired. So can you pay them for stuff that happened before their license expired? The answer is yes, you can. Same thing with people whose licenses go inactive for any reason, like they didn't take their CE or anything. Firms are allowed to pay brokers for work they did while their license was active, even if their license is currently inactive or expired. So closing kind of that. Closing, exactly. So you put it under contract, let's say you go under contract, uh, you know, and the closing's on July 2nd, and you forgot to take your CE. Can your firm pay you the commission for that? If your firm and your broker in charge is willing to justify that all the work was done previous to your license going inactive, then yes, they can. Now, keep in mind, part of the deal is what? Attending the closing. Right. So I would dare say they probably need to reduce the payment of commission because somebody's got to attend the closing and it can't be the person whose license is inactive. So what if it, what if it, if it become expired? Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. You pay you for work that you did while you were still active. That's a long, well now, 18 months or so. Well, depending on how long you stay. I mean, because expired, you could be expired July 2nd. Okay, so make sure you know the, the proper way we are paid, paid by our firms. Um, referral fees can be paid directly to brokers. That's the only thing that can be paid, and that's only if your license is not hung with a firm. If you're a full broker and your license is hung with a firm, even your referral fees have to be paid to your firm and then to you. Which means your firm is going to get a piece of it, that's why you depending on your contract with them, that's all of your contract with them. The Real Estate Commission does not get in the middle of commission disputes. It's one of the things they don't deal with. Okay, um, hopefully you would be self-explanatory on page 604 that uh, fraudulent or dishonest dealing would be a prohibited act. Um, cannot do that, cannot lie to people or commit fraud. The one that will be tested for sure is on the right side of page 604, the prohibitive practice of law. Don't write things into contracts. Just don't do it. You fill in the blank with what the blank was meant for and that's all. <coughs> nothing more, nothing less. Don't give legal opinions about things. This is one I'm going to point out to you. You'll probably see it on a test somewhere. Telling somebody that something is or is not allowed in the covenants, that's a legal opinion. That's practicing law. You don't do that. If a client asks you, well, do the covenants allow this? What you do is you give them a copy of the covenants, and you might even say, that's on page so-and-so, or the information about that is on page so-and-so. If you have any further questions, talk to your attorney. Is a pool allowed? Don't give a yes or no answer. That's a legal opinion. You send them to the information and you send them to an attorney for the purposes of answering a test question. Right? Just FYI, that's the answer they'll expect to see. All right? I'm not going any further down that because I'm on video. Um, all right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, go back to your dates page. Uh, let's talk about notifying the commission of um, things you've done that you shouldn't have done. Well, the first one is fine. Moving. You have 10 days to notify the commission of a change of address. Well, I bet you that. Yes. These are all days that you are notification of the commission of the law. Right. Notification to the Real Estate Commission. Ten days to notify them of a change of address. Well, how does the commission know the start of the ten days? I mean, I'm sorry? How would they know the start of the ten days? I mean, it's like... So, I, I, yeah. I mean, I agree. I'm not yeah, saying it's, it's easy to police, rule. but that's the rule. Yeah. You have to notify them within ten days. You have 30 days after conviction to notify them of any criminal convictions.
30 days after final judgment. I would notify them of anything other than minor traffic. Minor being, you know, you got a speeding ticket for, you know, eight or nine miles over the limit. If it's anything like careless and reckless or anything like that, you notify them. If it's a DUI, you most certainly notify them. They frown upon them. If you have one on your criminal background, you will have to explain it. A big red flag for them. I'm not saying they won't issue the license, they probably will, but you will definitely have to explain any DUI. The thought process being, what are you going to do with your clients? Drive them around. So it makes sense. Um, that is one you have to be very careful of because if you get a DUI and want your license, they probably will suspend your license for some period of time. Maybe only 30 days, maybe 60 days, something like that, but you can pretty much count on a DUI conviction resulting in some disciplinary action from the commission. The sooner you notify them, the better. Okay, um, let's take a break and then we'll come back and jump back in on page 605. So if you don't have a DUI and your license is suspended, is there, is there an issue with the commission? Yeah. 